Hey everybody, today I am going to be reviewing Showgirls. This film came out in 1995. It was directed by Paul Verhoeven. Paul Verhoeven wanted to make a musical and Joe Osterhaus, who wrote Showgirls, suggested that he set whatever his next project is going to be in Vegas. He comes up with the script and Showgirls was the compromise. Now obviously if you know the long complicated history of Showgirls you know that it was very infamous in the 90s especially when it came out. It was I think the Razzie winner that year for worst film of the year. It was on all kinds of critics worst of the year list and it continued to be on like worst of the decade lists. But sometimes it happens where something like this can be really hated initially but then it can kind of become a novelty after a while people can warm to it. But even so, it's very jarring how much people hated it back then and people respond to it quite differently now. This film I would consider to be a cult classic, but even so, it's starting to get that art house appreciation from a lot of the cinephiles, like you're seeing it headlining on the Criterion Collection, so uh, go figure. I just find this film to be so fascinating from every single angle that you look at it to the point where it is it is difficult to discuss. It is difficult to review. What is going on here? Is this movie supposed to be satire? Is it supposed to be intentionally funny? Or is it meant to be taken seriously as a criticism of a certain type of living? Some of these questions I feel like I can answer for myself, other questions I cannot still. Regardless of it all, this is one of my favorite American movies of the 1990s and you can use that to discredit me as a movie reviewer all you want, but I, I'm quite serious about that. Is this movie a mess? Yeah. Is it repetitive? Absolutely. Is it contradictory? Yes. Is it cringy? Yes. Is it totally flawed? Yes, yes, yes. To it all. Showgirls is rude and crude and vitriolic and gaudy and it's just so craptastic that I honestly feel like I could cry. Still, this film to me works as a sumptuous, operatic, joyous piece of of art, of cinematic art. I know that a lot of people love the camp and the excess, the aesthetic of the film, and that is part of what, you know, brought it into its cult status eventually. But honestly, I, I think it's much more than the aesthetic. I think that for it to have the lasting impact that it has, where the consensus seems to constantly be developing, there needs to be something to it more than that. Ironically, I think that this film is, is very human in a lot of ways, even though it is, you know, meant to be an exploitive piece. And I know I'm probably supposed to say things like, oh, this is like my favorite guilty pleasure film and all that, you know, I, but no, I genuinely love this movie. And I know that it kind of has that guilty pleasure packaging by design, but I see that merely as the outer layer. I think this is legitimately a good film. And I honestly don't know if I find the conversation about whether we should take the film seriously or not that interesting. I mean, yes, it is interesting on a certain level, but I kind of feel like yeah, the movie is a lot like life. It's serious sometimes, very serious sometimes. It can get very dark, but it can be also very light and naive and cheeky and fun. It can also be disgusting and awkward. So it's all the things. And I, I consider it almost like a Rorschach test for each viewer. It's, it honestly reminds me a little bit of Funny Games, which came out the same year, or no, I'm sorry, it came out in 1997. Well, close enough. I consider that film to be a, a sort of exploitive experiment, and so it is very much of a Rorschach test where it's more about the viewer and how you respond to it. And again, there's there's elements of that in this film. I just love to see the reactions. Like, you know, when it comes to the dialogue, there are certain people that absolutely hate the dialogue. They think it is absolutely the worst they've ever heard, but it's like, I guess, one man's trash is another man's treasure because where you see bad dialogue, I see something really special going on here. This might actually be one of my favorite scripts of its time, uh, and it's certainly one of the funniest scripts I think I've ever heard in my life. Like I said, some of it is very intentional and some of it does not land at all, but again, I almost buy into that more because it's got this certain cringy soap opera sort of feeling to it. A satirical artifice that I think that you can read in multiple ways. It's like almost every line you hear, you could kind of read it as a double meaning, whether it's through humor or through something kind of dark. The constant conversations about nails between the women, as an example. You know, some people laugh at those scenes. Some people find the context of it to be a little bit bizarre, whether it's a metaphor for something deeper or not. But to me, it's just like, no, this is diva on diva speak, bitches. And I think the movie needs that in order for it to succeed. This movie has to have that Naomi Campbell walking out of prison in a Versace gown type of energy. And yet somewhere in there between the, the ladies, especially Elizabeth Berkeley and Gina Garchon, I, I find a sadness to the whole nail conversation. The doggy chow line, of course, is, is infamous between the ladies. Oh yeah, and there's that terrible line where that guy is like, oh, in America, everyone's a gynecologist. 
because it does feel like a weird melange of all the weird like opening dialogue you've heard from from bad pornos. They'll always have like the setup skit between the people and there will always be some sort of line that comes out of nowhere and it makes you laugh and you're wondering like how was that intentional or not and I really think this film has the same type of feeling to it. So if you are like me I think it's quite easy to lean into this type of humor as off color as it can sometimes be and I don't know how you can't laugh out loud constantly throughout this film. As I was watching this for my review, I had to keep pausing the movie because I kept wanting to write down the lines. They were just so funny. Everybody got AIDS and shit. I nearly spit my drink out for that one. But you're the only one who can get my tits popping right. <laughs> the gayest man in the entire movie is literally at rehearsal telling the showgirls, thrust it, thrust it. The humor, the sadness, the desperation uh, in these lines. It, it has this relentless energy to it that I just, I love it. People criticize the acting for being bad and I'm like, is it really that bad or is it kind of that Brian De Palma thing where these characters are almost like fragments of the past, borrow from those old MGM musicals from, you know, like the 1950s or like the old WB musicals from the 1930s, I would say maybe even more so in some ways. I'm thinking like Footlight Parade or 42nd Street. It's almost a spinning out of a lot of those pastiche elements, but brought forward again by this new gritty exploitation type of piece that does feel very pre-code era to me. As in the Hays Code, watch the movies from the 1930s, the, the musicals that I just mentioned, or as I mentioned, the, the mid-1950s, and you will see, you know, obviously these movies are really expensive, gorgeous and sumptuous and all of that, but honestly, a lot of these movies, when you look between the musical numbers, a lot of it is filler. I argue Showgirls is actually less awkward than a lot of those musicals that I mentioned. We did like a Patreon viewing a long time ago of uh, An American in Paris, and I think a lot of my patrons were surprised at how, yeah, awkward, cringy the dialogue is. And yet I still love that movie. Now, when we're talking about like pre Hays Code movies from like the 1930s, yeah, there's just a brutality to it, but also it's just the idea of women being kind of smacked around on screen like it's nothing and it's often played for laughs. That, that energy is definitely in Showgirls. Yeah, there's an artistic subversive feeling to this movie that feels different from so many of the other type, movies of its type, I should say. There's a brightness and a celebratory feeling to this film. You can, you can tell the people who made it love the cinema, and yet it also has, again, that seedy, exploitive, very controversial feeling to it. And I think just that sweet spot is where it needs to be. But this one I think takes it a step further with the cynicism and I think it definitely wants to punish the audience for wanting the main character su to succeed and I think that aspect of it does remind me again of, of funny games. There is a line early on in the movie where Nomi, uh, our main character, hitches a ride to Vegas and she's never been there before. She's going with big aspirations to become a showgirl, a dancer. She's playing the slots and of course a, a random guy tries to pick her up. She walks away and she's you know offended by it or whatever and he yells back at her like, come on, you gotta sell it sometime. And I think that that line kind of echoes as the perfect thesis set in motion. It's going to echo, I think, through the mind of our main character, but I think just many women in life because sex is our currency, sex is our survival tactic to a degree. And this film is really Again, rubbing your nose in that. Of course, know me as a character, that is the big problem for a lot of people who criticize the film. And yes, her character is a choice. It is a choice. I like her though. I personally think that she's great. I can totally understand why you may not like her character in the first 20 minutes of the movie because she is just this like spastic raging bitch and you wanna punch her in the face. And she's always very spastic in a way that feels very unrealistic and yet somehow she kind of reins it in, she settles into it more as the character starts to develop and I start to buy into it more. I like that she's just so brazen, there's no softness, no refinement, no subtlety to any of her movements or any of her actions as a person. It's like somebody Yes, in their early 20s. Someone just trying to figure things out and they are just very naive to the world. And, you know, she can't rein it in because she's never been disciplined. And we learn that later. She's been around and she's done a lot to survive. And when she's like giving lap dances to the Kyle McLaughlin character, it, like, she looks like a fish that's been caught and it's just flopping on a deck. Again, it's just the feeling of desperation. And sure, it is strange and funny, but I also see all of it to be tinged with a, a sadness because I see her as like this symbol, again, of a certain type of woman who is very desperate. I'm using the word desperation a lot in this, this review, but I really feel like showgirls is like the word desperation just perfectly fits with it. She is strong-willed, she's independent, 
I wouldn't call her smart, but I wouldn't call her dumb either. I think she, you know, slowly starts to figure it out and her spastic behavior becomes somewhat infectious, I admit, at a certain point. The brassiness, I think, turns into this kind of vivacious spirit. And then there's an excitement for what she's doing. And I think she really carries the audience. Really, she carries me along uh, with her on that journey. I really like the moment where she goes home, you know, to her roommate, Molly, and she's like, I got the audition. And she lets out this squeal that I think is is really genuine and uh, endearing. And I think that's the point where I started to, to switch the first time I saw the film. You know, I started to want her to succeed in this sleazy world. Nomi does go deeper into the seven circles of hell through the film, and each time she is presented with an obstacle, a lot of them are incredibly repetitive, which creates kind of a kind of a tonal problem, I think, for some people. But whether it's redundant or not, uh, it constantly reminds me of her confliction and what she is running from. I think one of her best traits is even though she is, she becomes very selfish, she is very selfish, uh, she is fiercely loyal. And I consider her to be a really great best friend. Even when she does reach the pinnacle and, and all of her dreams are coming true, she never compromises her true relationships. And when things go too far, she is willing to walk away from the thing that she wants in honor of the people that she loves. Now she's never quick to give up her sense of self and therein lies the dilemma for her character. Almost like in a Mulholland Drive sort of feeling, it starts to materialize through the Gina Garchon character. You know, she is the successful established star that Nomi wants to be. And Gina as Crystal in this movie, she is just... She is dripping with rhinestones and her sensuality, the tension that she holds in her mouth, that smirk, the lips. She gets it. She knows what kind of movie that she's in. She's having fun. This is the best performance in the entire film. Not only is she having fun with it, but she's giving the character depth where you actually feel sorry for her throughout the film, even though you don't really know what's going on with her character. Yet, you can always sense that there is a softness in her, as I said, a sadness, but she's also very seasoned, but she is relentless in her pursuit of Nomi. And obviously as a diva, you've got to be quite relentless because Nomi is who she used to be, reminds her of who she used to be, and so it's like two halves becoming a whole for a brief period in time. And it's like once they meet each other, they can free themselves respectively from their, I don't know, emotional prisons. It is kind of a, a doppelganger situation. The meta abstractions of facing the self is big, you know, with those two characters and representation. Still, it is the same old trope of, of the diva seeing the new starlet and being like, you know, you and I are not so different. That whole conversation we've seen at nauseum. And I think Crystal as a character, she's clearly very angry, um, but I don't think that she's angry at Nomi. I think she's a little more angry actually at the uh, Kyle MacLachlan character. And I think that she's just more angry at the industry that she's in and the industry that she is starting to become too old for perhaps. It's starting to pass her by just like anybody who is, you know, a product of their environment and they do not know how to get out of that environment because it's all that they know and that can be very sad. It is the same case with a lot of the characters in this movie, but Crystal is embracing being a diva and obviously the performance lends itself to that. Whereas Nomi is just resisting. She is so in denial for so long in the movie. And again, we, we applaud her for it. We applaud her for it and want her to succeed again in this new world until it just becomes too much and we can't root for her anymore. And to say this film is a cautionary tale, I also think is a little bit boring of a statement. I think that this is like a tour through Xanadu, but like filtered through some weird fun house where like the male gaze and all the academia that we know in, um, you know, cinematic studies and all of that is just kind of sifted through the movie. I think it's less about the shock of voyeurism because it's already existing in that world. So where a lot of movies like this are more, you know, making a, a commentary about how humans are always reaching for, for shiny objects, this movie is about people who already have those shiny objects in their possession and they are surrounded by them and they don't know how to let them go as stimulants, especially when they are not enjoying it. And the bubble world of Vegas, Vegas is such a unique place. There's nothing like it in the world, um, but it's very much a bubble. And then it feels like you, you go outside and you're in reality. And being a product of that type of environment, it makes it very hard for you to be able to escape it. And to me, that is the pain. That is the shock. It is not about 
the naked women in the movie. It is about the brutal juxtaposition between the bubble world and reality. Like all the glitz and glamour, and then you hear a conversation about a, a girl getting pregnant and the guy has to stop dancing because uh, he has to become a grocer to uh, support his family. Or, um, you know, seeing children backstage at a, a titty show. Children surrounded by nudity, violence, drugs, and language. And I'm like, now that to me is that is the scandal of this film. It's the cynicism. It's it's like girls hurting each other, Tanya Harding, Nancy Kerrigan style, to get ahead. And it's characters like Molly, who's the purest character, the only good character. She plays the Nomi's roommate and best friend. Um, if they cast her today, I feel like they would have cast somebody like Tessa Thompson, somebody who just has like a purity to her, and especially Hart, because it's going to be devastating what happens to her. She has to catch all the shrapnel of these scumbags. There is always a sacrificial lamb in a story, and I think maybe the first time you see the film, this part of the film can feel very jarring and it can really turn people against it. But I think it does kind of have to go there because of the desensitization of the characters, of the viewers. And you know what? That's often how life is. Usually the person that doesn't deserve the pain gets all of the pain. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people all the time. So yes, it's like the party is going and then boom, the blow of this horrific event. I do think that it's, it's quite effective. It's a really good cinematic climax. But in the last 15, 20 minutes of the movie, I feel like Yes, there is a celebration of like femininity and girl power, women celebrating women and women looking after other women, which is really nice, but there's also a really devastating angle to it. I think all of this has just contributed to the disintegration of our main character. It's like, sure, Nomi has proved that she's a very loyal friend and she did the right thing when it counted, but she is more hardened now than she ever was and perhaps more... Uh, frenzied and angry than she ever was. Sure, our character took control of her life and she has freed herself in a sense from the spell of Las Vegas, but um, just for now. So when you see the mirroring of the opening scene and, and the closing scene, it could be read as one of those, oh, here we go again type of slapstick moments. But, you know, again, on repeated viewings, it burns. And whatever happens to our main character, I just can't see it being good. There are times when I'll watch a movie and I'll think, oh, you know, it has a, a deep self-awareness and oh, but over here it's, it's not self-aware enough. But I think sometimes, very, very rarely, but sometimes, and in the case of Showgirls, I feel like when you can combine those feelings, there can be a sweet spot and something fresh and unique and surprisingly complex can happen. And I think it is, yes, the mix of intentional and unintentional that all contributes to the lattice work here. And I think that's true of most movies. It's like sometimes the best things that happen are not intentional. And this is, you know, a Paul Verhoeven film and I greatly admire that man. I think he is just so interesting in the sense that he's willing to explore the deep kind of contradictions of the cinematic language in a way that is way more bold than most of the American directors. I personally think that this film should have been made in Europe instead. It just feels like Europeans would get a kick out of it, get the humor, Americans not so much. I find in America, a lot of people need the morality and, and, and the commentary on, on fame to be more cut and dry. And I don't really get that because again, this is a Verhoeven film and it is an exploitation piece. This is one of those movies, every single viewing gets better and better and better. I adore this film, you guys. It is this weird mix of like Beyond the Valley of the Dolls meets All About Eve meets like Tommy Wiseau's The Room. And getting to review it gave me an excuse to get to watch it multiple times again. And I have more appreciation for it now than I ever did. And again, I think that's a really good sign. So I think this is one of those movies you gotta see it to believe it. You may hate it, you may love it, but I don't think you'll deny that it is a very interesting ride. And that is my review. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to plug my website as always. It is deepfocuslens.com. I'm an artist. I do commission portraits and I sell prints of my work. If that is something that you're interested in, you can always go to the website below. And if you have a question about a commission or a print, you can always email me. My email is in the description box below as well. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to my patrons who are great. Guys, thank you so much for your support and welcome to all the new members. If you're interested in supporting, the link for that is below as well as the rest of my social media information. You can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.